Tonight we are going to talk about coding the markets with Python and this is going to be interesting to say the least because this is my first ever live coding stream. I've done a lot of streams about trading and different market things, but I've never done a live coding webinar. So this will be <laughs> this will be interesting. I hope that it's not a disaster, but if it is, then, you know, it'll be like watching a train wreck. It'll be interesting anyway. Okay, so just one last note. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but if you are having any trouble with echoes, either mute your Discord chat or mute Twitch. If you have both of them going at the same time, then it'll cause echoes. So that's where we stand right now. So tonight we're going to talk about coding the markets with Python. And what we're going to do is I'm going to build something live and... Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, I run lazyfa.com. I'm also a trader, but I, I run lazyfa.com on the side and um, it's all written in Python and I'm sort of a self-taught Python developer. I've been working in Python and Django for about seven or eight years now. Um, and it's something that I picked up before I left my job to trade full time. I was a, I was a systems engineer um, and so I was already kind of a tech person, but uh, I picked up coding after I started trading full time because I needed a way to quickly research companies. And what I wanted to do was basically build a little Python script that would go out to like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or some other site like that and scrape information off of those sites um, so that I could do faster research. So that's how Lazy FA started. And now it's turned into this big full-blown web application. And I've sort of accidentally turned myself into a software developer also, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's what we're gonna do tonight. Just to give you a little bit of background about who I am and where my coding um, skills come from or <laughs> lack of skills. Um, so what I've done here is I have a little bit of boilerplate stuff set up already. And what I wanna do tonight is basically just uh, experiment a little bit with some market APIs. We're going to use Quandl tonight, which is a, a well-known uh, financial data provider. So they have all kinds of different data sets that give you things like pricing data and you can get um, data off the financial statements and you can even get stuff from like the Fed and global economic data and things like that. Um, so what we're going to do is use that uh, in a pretty basic way, just to show you how to get started with it and show you what, you know, some of the potential is like for working with this kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to do. And so this is my, <clears throat> this is my GitHub. Um, it's github.com slash CKZ8780. So if you want to um, follow along with this, uh, either follow along or just do it afterwards when watching the recording recorded video. Um, this is what I'm using as my starter template. So this is a template that I made a while ago. Um, I primarily develop in Django. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this is here. It's just a clone of this repo. So if you want to follow along to start off, all you need to do is clone this repo and that's where this video is going to start. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just follow my own instructions in this repo and hope that they are correct, <laughs> which they may or may not be. Um, so I've already done this part um, and I'm at the point now where I want to install the requirements. And this is something that's specific to Django. So if you're not familiar with Django, you'll need to be um, a little bit, but if you're not, you'll still be able to follow along. I'll explain as we go. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is just install the requirements for this project. And we can do that with pip install dash r requirements dot text. And what that's going to do is just take this requirements file here that just has Django and PyTZ Py in it. And it's going to install those requirements. Um, so once that is done, we are going to need a couple of other requirements, but I'll install those in a couple of minutes. And then the next thing uh, I'm going to do is just take the, where did it go? Next thing I'm going to do is just take the project itself and rename it. Um, 
So the my project settings.py, um, we're not going to worry about updating the secret key, but I'll update um, installed apps, the URL config, and the WSGI app. And there's just some comments in the file. If you've cloned this, they'll be right here. So all you have to do is this is going to be called stock sound demo. So um, the app, I'm just going to call it home because it's just going to be the home page. So I'll rename that and then change the installed app here to home. And then the myproject.urls, <clears throat> the WSGI application, and I think that's it, is going to be called stock sound demo. And I think that's everything. The secret key we don't need to worry about. And uh, we also need to rename whiskey.py. In here, this has got to be stock sound demo.settings. So that's referencing this settings file. And then <clears throat> update the app URLs include. So my app.urls is now called home.urls. And that's referencing this URLs file here. Uh, source manage.py needs to change to my project.settings. Also, this needs to change to stock sound demo. And then apps.py here will also need to change to home. Technically, this should be called home config but it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> uh, okay, completely optional. I'm gonna ignore that for now. It's just renaming the comments because they all say my project and my app. So I'm gonna ignore that for now. Uh, rename my project to my app folders. We've already done that. And then if you wanna track your changes, you would just delete the git folder and reinitialize it. So theoretically, now that we've installed the requirements, and changed all of that stuff. I should be able to Python 3, Python manage.py run server in order to run it. And there's no module named stock sound demo. So where is that? Uh, by the way, to start this, if you're already familiar with Django, you can just create a new Django app. Um, ah, here, I forgot to rename this folder. Stock sound demo. Let's try that again. Okay, cool, so the server's running. So now we can go to localhost here. And we have this sort of boilerplate template. Um, this was just something that I put together so that I would have an easy way to have Bootstrap installed and you know all the basic stuff like navigation and a brand link and stuff. Um, so it's just a shell, basically. I'm gonna delete the contact page, eh, well, we won't worry about that for now. Um, but those can go away because they have since been renamed. And that should be it. <clears throat> so that's enough to get it started. Now, if you're not familiar with, <laughs> shut up, nice. So if you're not familiar with how Django works, I'll give you the 30 second explanation. When you go to 127001 colon 8000, that's the port that Django's uh, dev server is listening on, and you go to slash about, what happens is it looks in the, in the root URLs file here, and it looks for well, we'll start here actually. If you just go to slash, right, that takes you to the home page. So the first URL file that it looks in is this one, and it finds that there's nothing at the end of the URL. So it goes into home.urls and will find uh, the one called home, right, which doesn't have any anything at the end of it. Um, so about, right, when you go to about, what it's doing is finding this URL and then it's calling this view 
from views.py. So you see here on line 19, I'm importing views from the current directory. And that's triggering this Python function here, which takes in a request and it returns a template uh, and a context, which is just a Python dictionary that is then going to be available in the template. Uh, so that's how you can get variables from your, uh, from your view into your template. And that's what we're going to use. So we really don't need the contact page or the about page, um, but I'll keep them in here just to show how the navigation works. But that aside, once this is set up, the majority of the code that we're going to build is in this file here. Um, is in views.py. In particular, it's in the home view. I don't know how these ended up over indented, but um, if you end up with syntax errors or anything like that, uh, you'll just have to tinker around with it because I made that repo a while ago. There's no guarantees that there's not mistakes in it. Uh, so, but so far so good. So all of our code is going to be in here. And the other two things that we're going to need in order to do this, and while I'm at it, I'm also just gonna run uh, manage.py migrate, which will apply these migrations. These are database migrations. They're not really necessary right now for what we're gonna do, but it's just a good idea to do that as a first step. So that's all good. <clears throat> uh, and then we can run the server again. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is just build something here on the home page. So if I just put a variable called test, this is a test, then in home.html here in the templates folder, All I need to do is render out test, and that should show me that variable that came back from the view. <clears throat> so that's how we're gonna get data from Quandle into this template. So I am using, by the way, I, I tinkered around with this a little bit um, yesterday, and I did already build this thing so I'm hoping that we're gonna have time to get through it all. It's 7.15, this is gonna be quick. It's gonna be hard to, hard to get all this stuff in, um, but I'll copy and paste where I can and try not to over explain things. Um, but if you, if you have questions, then feel free to ask. Um, so before we can do anything with Quandle, we need to get a Quandle account. So I'll show you how to do that. I've already got one, but I'm just gonna create another one. Just using a temporary email address just to show you what the process is like. Uh, so let's, <clears throat> uh, why is this, let's see, refresh. This is the email that I used yesterday, so I just want a different one. Give me another one, damn it. Um, oh, here we go, change. What the fuck, change the email. Um, okay, stock sound demo. All right, so we'll copy that. So this is the process of uh, actually signing up for a Quandle account. It's really simple. So stock sound demo, it's gonna be a personal account. I'll throw that email in there. <clears throat> How will you be using this uh, for a personal software development project? Next, create a password. Okay, I'm not a robot. Agree to the terms and conditions, and voila. And it gives you your API key. So um, I I guess I, I don't really care if this is on screen because I'm not gonna use it for anything, but um, 
this is what it looks like. So you'll want to copy this and save it somewhere. Um, but I'm actually already using, I've already got another one. I have, <laughs> I have two other ones. One that I created yesterday, which is like uh, just a demo one. And then I have my real one. But uh, I don't know if we'll need this or not, but I'll save it just in case. So then the other thing we have to do is verify our email address. So let's do that quickly. Confirm address. And account successfully confirmed. Okay, so that's all it takes to set up a Quandl account. Um, <clears throat> now Quandl has a whole bunch of different data types. You can see down here there's different asset classes if you want data on equities or currencies or whatever. So there's all kinds of different data. The one that we're gonna to use tonight is Sherrader. And specifically, we're gonna use Sherrader equity prices. And so they have pretty good documentation. If you go to the documentation tab, um, it's really easy to get started with this. You just need your Quandl API key and then uh, the Quandl package for Python. You can do this via the web also, um, but uh, I'm gonna use the Quandl package tonight just because it's more modern, but uh, you, you know you can do it via the web as well. Um, so it'll take CSV or JSON or there's a couple of, I think there's one other one that it'll, that it'll take. Um, but I'm going to use Quandl. So on that note, we need to install Quandl. Uh, so pip install Quandl. And we're also gonna need requests. So Quandl will also take care of installing pandas and numpy and all the other stuff that it needs. So we'll first install that. And then we could have done this at the same time, but install. We're also gonna need requests. And oh, I guess we've already got that. Uh, okay. Lots of visual distortion. Hold on. Yeah, for some reason it's uh, it's all blurry. Hold on a second, let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if there's anything that I can really do about it right now. I can tell you that it'll definitely be clear on the YouTube video because that's just recording my screen. <clears throat> Let's see. Just checking to see if there's any settings in uh, OBS that I can play with here. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> uh, all right, so where were we? Just random white lines. Yeah, I mean, I I'm also streaming from Linux. I usually do this from Windows, but... I wanted to use Linux tonight just because that's what I usually develop in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've got the Twitch stream up on my um, on my screen also, and I see what you mean. It's freaking out for some reason. Not sure what the deal is with that. I'm going to actually close Twitch on my end and see if that. Actually, I don't want to do that because then I'll lose <clears throat> the ability to watch that chat channel. Uh, where the fuck did that go? Okay, well, 
Uh, if the Twitch stream doesn't work out, then this will definitely be clear on YouTube. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, so we've got Quandle installed. We have... Um, so we got Quandle installed. We have requests. It's from the server again. And <clears throat> so the first thing that we need to do in order to actually use this Quandle database is set up the uh, API key. <clears throat> so uh, let's see here. What am I looking for? <laughs> I also usually have... I've got everything on one monitor right now, which is throwing me off because I usually have the browser on one screen and my terminal on another and the code in the center. So this is kind of messing with my head a little bit. Uh, okay, so we're going to need a few things here. Let's take care of some imports before anything. We're going to need uh, OS. We won't technically need that, but I'm going to use it just to show how you would want to do this. Uh, so we're going to need OS. We're going to need Quandle. We're going to need requests. Do we need requests? We actually don't need requests anymore because we're using the Quandle package, but we will need JSON. All right, so the first thing that we have to do here is set up Quandle. And what I wanna do is, so my goal right now with this application is just to spit out some uh, prices onto the screen and then I'll show you what we're gonna do with those. So in order to do that, we'll start with uh, prices equal to none just so that we can return it to the template even if it doesn't exist. And I should preface this by saying I am far from a professional developer. Um, so if you are better than me or you're more experienced than me in Python, I apologize for teaching you shitty habits but you're just gonna have to deal with it. So that's where we stand. Um, so we're gonna need prices. We're also gonna need a ticker, which is gonna come from a text box on the homepage. Uh, so that'll also start with, that'll also be none. And then we will put that here as well. ticker and ticker. All right, <clears throat> so right now those are just none. Um, however, if the request method is post, uh, then that's where we're going to actually do stuff with Quandle. Um, so that's where we're going to set up the Quandle API. And normally what you would wanna do is the reason that I used OS is we would wanna take this uh, API key and get it out of our code. So we would do something like os.getenv uh, and we would say like stock sound API key, something like that, and just give it none as a default. Um, so this is just to keep it out of your code if you're gonna commit it to GitHub. So then what you would do is set it up as an environment variable here by doing export stock sound API key equals I thought I just copied the API key, but I guess not. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so now what we should get, um, and we can actually comment this out and pull this back just to prove that it's working. Um, so let's just copy that and let's just print it out. and make sure that that works. 
Yes, I know, indentation error. There's uh, some quirks with this repo because at the time I built it, uh, I think I was using spaces. There was a difference between whether I was using spaces or tabs for indentation. I've changed it. And for some reason, my sublime text, for whatever reason, uh, it keeps changing back to indent with tabs. So that should take care of that. All right, so now if we go to the home page, this is a test is gone and we get our Quandle API key here in the terminal. So that is working, so that's good. Um, so now, <clears throat> We don't actually need that. So what we're gonna do is um, on the home page, I'm gonna copy in some code from the completed project here. And I'm actually just gonna copy the entire block and just go through it sort of line by line to show you what we're going to do. Um, so this is what it started out as. I'm just gonna replace this core block here with the completed code. And so <clears throat> what it has is, it's pretty simple. There's a form and then there's this if prices block. So if prices comes back as something, right? As not none from the view, then we'll render out this block of code as well. Um, but the main piece here is gonna be this form. And what it has is just a ticker box. So it's just a text box with a submit button and it's going to submit, it's gonna to post to the home URL and it's just gonna post a ticker. So we save that. Um, this is what the home page is gonna look like. So, and I realized by the way, I'm not typing this all here line by line, but, um, you know, it, we just don't have time. So you can copy this from the repo afterwards if you want, I'll make this available on GitHub. Um, but it's pretty simple, just a form, and then there's gonna be a table with a button and a couple of other things. So that's that. And then uh, when we post a ticker, we should be able to get it here in the view by just grabbing it out of the uh, post request. So ticker is going to equal request.post.get ticker. And that is all we should need for right now. So let's just print that out and make sure that it's working. So if we put a ticker in here like Apple, it get data, then we'll see that ticker show up here in the terminal. So that gives us a ticker. And what we're gonna do is send that ticker to Schrader and we'll use it to get the equity prices for Apple. And this is actually really simple to do, um, but I'm gonna tweak it a little bit. So I'll start with just this, just so you can see what it looks like, but we'll uh, play around with it a little bit as well. So all we're gonna do is just get the, the Schrader slash SEP, that's uh, Schrader equity prices table, and just give it the ticker, and we'll set that equal to prices. And this is gonna return a, um, a pandas data frame. So if we print it out, you'll see what it looks like. This is how Schrader works, and I think it's consistent for all of Quandle. Um, it uses, the Quandle package returns pandas data frames. So if you're not familiar with pandas, you'll have to get familiar with pandas in order to be able to use this. But if we put that in, uh, okay, so truth value of a data frame is ambiguous. Yeah, that's because of the template. So I'm gonna ignore that for now. That'll be fixed in a minute. Um, but this is the this is the data frame. So what it gives you is the ticker, the date, and then it gives you the open, high, low, and close data, as well as the volume and dividends and a couple of other things. So we're gonna just pluck out the date and the close, and you'll see why this is, by the way, this whole project is 
potentially one of the dumbest, most pointless things I've ever made. <laughs> uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, okay. So, in order to get just the... Um, in order to get just the close and the date columns, we can use another argument here from the documentation called QOps. And so this is how you would get like multiple tickers, um, tickers for a specific date uh, or a date range. And then this is the one that we actually want is these, the indicators. Um, so if I copy this, what I actually want is just the date and the close. Whoops. And everything else I don't really care about. So now if we go and print out prices again, <clears throat> you'll see that we have the same error here in the template. Um, forgot a comma. So we'll have the same error in the template, but that will be fixed in a moment. So now we have just the date and the close. All right. <laughs> You're close, DMW4K4. It's actually a lot it's actually a lot less uh, exciting than that. <laughs> it's completely pointless, but it's fun. Uh, is Quandle superior to Yahoo Finance? Um, so I've never used Yahoo Finance. I don't know if they have an API, um, but I've never used them. Quandle is very standardized. So I use Quandle very heavily for Lazy FA. Um, and yes, I would say that it's probably superior to Yahoo Finance even without you having ever used Yahoo Finance, um, an API approach is always going to be better than scraping. So, uh, all right. So the other thing that I want to do here is convert this to a JSON format. So it's just going to be, we can just use the two JSON method of pandas. And if we use orient equals records, um, that'll make it so that we have just date and close as keys and values. So it'll give us an array of um, dictionaries that have date and close as the keys and then their respective values. Uh, and then we can also choose a date format. And this just comes straight from the pandas documentation. Um, so I'm going to use ISO for that, which will just give us the, uh, the ISO format for the date instead of... Um, a, a Unix epoch timestamp. Uh, and that should be, so now if we print that out again, we should see, <clears throat> again, the same error. Ah, so it's gone now because <clears throat> prices actually exist. So that's cool. Um, so if we look at prices, <clears throat> so you can see now it's, a, it's an array of JSON data which is much easier to work with in the template. So that's pretty much all we need from Quandle. The only thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reverse it um, just so that we have the most recent data first because as you can see, it starts with, uh, actually we want the, the most recent data last just because of what we're gonna be doing, but it, it starts with the most recent data first. And this is the free version of Quandle, by the way. So it's only giving us like a small snippet of what's actually available. Um, there's a bunch of like tickers that you can use to test with. Um, it'll give you, if you look at sample data here, you can use all of these tickers just to experiment with it. Um, and Quandle also has, or Sherrader also has a number of other data sets besides just the equity prices. Um, so this <clears throat> is just one of their data sets. They've also got, um, 
They've got core U.S. fundamentals. They have an equities bundle, which has like institutional data and insider data, as well as equity prices. Um, they've also got fund prices for ETFs and mutual funds. Um, and so there's a bunch of different data sets. And on top of Quandle, or on top of Sherrader, Quandle also has a number of other data providers that have other data as well. So just to give you an idea of what's possible, we're just you know, scratching the surface here just to demonstrate something. Um, okay, so you can see that we don't have our prices yet, but that's only because we have not returned them or we have returned them. So we have to see why that's not working yet. Um, so uh, the only thing I wanna do is just reverse the uh, data that we do have. So json.loads, and uh, that's why it's not working, by the way, because it's actually a string at the moment. It's a JSON string, so we're going to load it into a Python object and then just use the little reverse trick for Python lists. And that should be prices. And I think that should do it. So we put in Apple. Uh, prices. Okay, cool. So we have now starting in September of 2018, the close of Apple for every single day. So these are the daily close prices up to uh, 2018, 1231. So if you're using a real API key with a paid, um, you know, a paid subscription to this data set, then you would have something like 20 plus years of, uh, of data. Uh, not, not, always for, not always for the equity prices, but I think they have like, the equity prices has like 10 years of closed data. Um, and then their fundamentals have like up to 25 years. So there's a lot of stuff. All right. Uh, so that is, I mean, that's the meat of working with Quandle. If you want to get more stuff, right? If you want to get more, um, you know, more tickers or, um, you know, different indicators, if you want to create like an, an OHLC, like a candlestick chart, then it would be really easy to just grab, <clears throat> let's go back to getting started and where we did the specific indicators here. Um, for, uh, you know, just date and close or yeah, just the date and the close. You could also get the open, the high and the low and the volume. And it would be really easy to create a candlestick chart if you know how to work in HTML. So, so that's pretty much it for how to work with Quandle at a high level. Um, now of course, this doesn't really do anything right now. So let me show you the stupid part of it. This is the fun part. So I use this thing. I'm going to copy in this JavaScript file, which I grabbed from Stack Overflow. What I wanted to do was I wanted to hear what a stock sounds like when you play its prices as frequencies. So... um you know, this will play 228.36 hertz and 223.1 hertz. So it's completely pointless and really stupid, but uh, it was kind of interesting just to see what it does. So in order to do that, um, I just went to I just went to Google and looked up how to play a sound with JavaScript. Um, and I found that there's actually a built-in um, web API that you can use called um, Audio Context. And so I copied a snippet from Stack Overflow and I'm gonna just create a new JavaScript file in here. Whoops. So create a new folder called JS and a new file called, I'll explain this in a second. So this is gonna be called stocksound.js. Whoops. Too many JS's there. Let's rename that. All right, so stocksound.js. So um, 
this uh, play note function and the play melody. So like the core of this I got from Stack Overflow, um, but I did tweak it a little bit. So what I did was I added in um, this row at the top here in my table, which is going to, as you, once you click on play, um, it's gonna show you the current date and the current price that it's playing. Um, and that will update down throughout the the available date uh, date range here. Um, so that's the this is the stuff that I added to it. Um, and then I don't think I added anything else. So I had to change the function a little bit here just to add in the the date row so I could get it with um, just vanilla JavaScript. Normally I would use uh, React or something like that for this, but you know it was just a simple project, so I just wanted to do it with straight out you know, vanilla JavaScript so that anyone would be able to do it. Um, and then uh, all it does is recursively calls this play melody function. And the price data here is going to be the data that we're sending back from uh, the view. So we send this prices data back from the view. And then in the home template, if those prices exist, then we render a play button render a <clears throat> uh, heading here with the ticker and just a, a heading, and then create a table where for each price in the prices, we go through and we pull out the date and the close. And I'm giving each one of these rows here an ID that is equal to the date. So if you look at the inspector, you'll see that they all have you know, their timestamp as the ID just so that we can access them easily. And that's how I'm going to change their colors and stuff like that in the JavaScript file, uh, which is somewhere here. So I created a bunch of dates. So I created an array of dates there. Um, and how this gets into the JavaScript file, by the way, is a, at the moment, it probably seems like a mystery, but <clears throat> What I'm gonna do here is in, damn it, where the, f in home.html, there's one extra block that we need at the bottom. Um, and this postload.js block comes from the base template. So if you're familiar with Django, what's going on here is home is extending base.html and base.html has the high level HTML structure and then it has this block core, which is uh, replaced in all of these other templates. So in home, for example, we replace it with this block. And then it also has in the base template, just an empty block in case we wanna put any JavaScript files at the end. And that's what I'm replacing here in the home template. Um, so what I'm doing is using a built-in template filter from Django called JSON script. And what this does when you pipe a object into it, it will render it out as a script tag. So you'll see it if we refresh the page now. Um, notice that there is nothing at the bottom here except for the footer. But if we refresh the page with that little script in there, uh, let's see, invalid block tag, expected end block. What did I do here? Did I forget to load static? Yes. So this is a Django thing. I just forgot to load this uh, static tag so that it can get into my static files directories. So if we refresh that and inspect, now in the bottom here, see it creates this little script with an ID of price underscore data. And inside it is basically the string representation of that JSON object. So that has, it's just effectively uh, a way to safely render um, JSON objects in a script tag that comes back from Django so that you can get at them in JavaScript. So. Um, the JSON script template tag here, uh, it does 
everything for safety, like escaping special characters and things like that. Um, and then we just attach our stock sound script and um, that is where this is coming from here. So then we grab that price data ID, we get its text content and we parse it into a JSON object and then we can just map through it because it is in reality just an array of objects and these objects have a date key and a close key so we can create an array of the closes and an array of the dates and the reason i'm adding 100 here is just because if we do this on a low priced stock i don't want it to render i don't want it to play like a 20 hertz tone and blow my speakers so the 100 just effectively gives it a minimum of 100 hertz so that's just a safety thing in case you have your speakers really loud. Um, and then uh, we reverse them and reverse the dates just so that they line up. So remember that we reversed the data in um, the template. So we want to actually play it from, I wanna say we wanna play it from latest to earliest We'll have to see how this works. Um, and then there's a tempo here that you can set as well. So this all, like I said, this all came from Stack Overflow with the exception of my play function and I just tweaked the functionality a little bit. Um, but it was a you know, a simple Stack Overflow link, how to play frequencies with JavaScript. It was like the first link on Stack Overflow here. I just copied this and um, and tweaked it. So it took a little bit of playing around, but that's how this is working. Uh, all right, so <laughs> yes, you're right. It's not recursion. It's recursive like because it's calling a different function. You just have to start it from outside, but you're right. It's not recursion technically. You could actually do this with recursion, I think, um, but I don't know. I don't know exactly why the uh, the author did this a thousand times two fifty six and then divided by the note period times the um, you know times the second part here. In his example, it actually had so this plays like the Star Wars theme. Let me turn on the desktop audio so that this is recorded. Uh, let's see here. So desktop. All right. So if you run this snippet. <laughs> um, so you put in the frequencies and how long you want them to play. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know exactly what the significance of this like 256,000 is. So if anyone knows, feel free to let me know, but I don't know what the significance of that is. And I didn't uh, didn't have time to figure it out. But anyway, that is how this works. So what I did is just replaced all these frequencies with um, prices and gave them a constant time. And then the tempo, you can just adjust it however you want. So with any luck, I think that's all I need in order to make this work. So let's see if it works. So we refresh and I'll just put in uh, Microsoft and that is, hold on a second. Why did that not work? It didn't update the prices. Oh, I know why. It's because in views.py here, I have Apple hard coded. This needs to be ticker from request.post. So let's save that. And now we get Microsoft prices. So Apple, and here we go. Victory! <laughs> so, like I said, completely stupid and pretty pointless, but it is what it is. 
um, you know, it demonstrates how easy it is to work with something like Quandle to, you know, to build a web app that works with financial data. Um, so there are a few other ones that we could, that you can play with. Uh, what was really fun actually was I did this with my real API key. Um, At one point I had a back to top button here, but I'll put that into the finished project. Um, but anyway, it just gives you a, an idea of what's possible, right? If you wanted to do more, this is how you use Quandle. Um, and this is how you use financial data in general. It's gonna be like, you know, it's gonna be Pandas data frames and a lot of JSON stuff and a lot of dictionary navigation and uh, arrays and lists and just manipulating data. So that is how lazy FA started was just something dumb like this. And, you know, it turned into a full blown web application that I use for research. So <laughs> Jose, welcome, man. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and yes, this is, is completely ridiculous, right? Like, what was really fun was I did it with my my real API key, and um, I, I did it with uh, with LK, and when it crashes, it's just <laughs> like you know instant low frequencies. Cool. All right, so we have data from 1997 all the way to 2020. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> if we do LK. So it starts at 20 bucks and it ends up at $3. Um, DGLY was pretty funny also. So what I'm gonna do is change the tempo here. I'm gonna close that and, whoops, uh, I think I closed the project. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, all right, that's not what I wanted to do. So <clears throat> I'm gonna change the tempo here just so it doesn't take forever. Um, let's change this to 3000. And I'm going to hard refresh. Let's see what this sounds like. All right, so that, that's what LK sounds like. Let's throw in DGLY. DGLY is really long. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. Um, any requests? Yes, new feature of Lazy FA incoming. Square, good call. All right, let's check that out. Um, SQ. <clears throat> so from 2015, we're at 13 bucks. Oh, this one could get interesting around 2018. Um, there's a lot of data here though, so I'm gonna actually increase the tempo even more just to speed it up. Let's make this 7,500. And we'll hard refresh. And there's your price along the right. We're into 2018 here. All right. So one last one before we cut this off. Let's do Amazon, but we'll do it at 15,000 
because actually let's do it even higher than that. Let's do it at 25,000 just because Amazon has data all the way back to 1997. <clears throat> I warned you this was the most pointless thing I've ever built. So Amazon, play. It seems really slow. <laughs> yeah, we're only in 1999 here. I don't think it took my, uh, I don't think it took my change there to 25,000. Let me just refresh that. Hmm. Interesting. It's not, uh, maybe we can't go that high for some reason. That's strange. I thought I did this earlier, but maybe not. Well, anyway, you get the point. I'm not sure why that uh, refresh is not working. There's obviously something not right with that. I'm not sure why this is so slow either. Usually it's like instant. Huh. Yeah, for some reason it's not taking my, it's not taking my changes to the tempo. Um, but anyway, I won't waste any more time with this. That is how I use Quandl. Um, if you're not familiar with Lazy FA, um, this is what lazy fa looks like so i'll log in <clears throat> i think twitch is fucking with my internet connection here um so if we look at apple i use quandle for all of these charts so all of this stuff like revenues and uh, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement, all of the red flag detection that Lazy FA does, all of this data comes from Quandle. And well, most of it comes from Quandle, um, but this just gives you an idea of what's possible with these types of data sets. They are, they're relatively affordable and the stuff that you can do with them is truly amazing. So I hope that that gives you some inspiration if you're a new developer um or if you're just a if you're just a trader that's you know thinking about building something for yourself um hopefully that gives you a little bit of inspiration so let's go to questions real quick it's already uh, over an hour so i want to try to keep this brief from a question and answer standpoint if you do have questions that i'm not able to get to tonight um you feel free to email me, chris at lazyfa.com, if you want to get in touch with me. Um, <laughs> it's a bit overwhelming. How would you recommend to start? Um, all right, so yeah, let me let me back up to the beginning of these questions here. Why develop in Linux and not Windows? Um, it doesn't really matter, to be honest with you. The reason that I use Linux is because when I first started using um, when I first started using uh, Linux. I was working a lot in Docker, and Docker is a pain in the ass to get working on uh, Windows. So that's why that's why I use Linux. Uh, and then I just got it's easier to work with in terms of like virtual environments for me. So uh, it's just a preference, but I can develop on either one. Uh, what's the end game of what we're doing right now? So hopefully that's clear at this point. Yusuf, you're asking, this is a bit overwhelming, how would you recommend to start? So I would start with what I just did, except don't worry about the, um, you know, don't worry about the Django portion of it. 
you can just install Quandle, you know, and just do it straight from the command line. So you don't have to, you know, use Django and all that stuff. I just did that because I wanted to build something that, you know, actually had some, you know, some kind of a user interface, you know, something real. So, you know, you don't have to use Django for this. Um, what I would recommend is, uh, you know, hit up the documentation here for Quandle. And, and if you're not familiar with Python, um, Corey Schaefer is really good for Python tutorials. And there's another guy on YouTube. Um, uh, what is his name? Um, Centdex. So Centdex, this guy's channel is really, really cool. He does all kinds of cool stuff with like machine learning and AI um, and natural language processing and that kind of thing. So um, he's got a lot of really good videos on everything from entry level all the way up to like really advanced Python stuff. So play around with that also. Is Quandle Premium worth it? How much does it cost? Yeah, so I think it's worth it, but it depends on what you're doing with it. Um, and the range for what it costs is like 1200 to, actually I think now it's like, it's like 15 or 1600 a year, um, but you can pay more depending on what you want access to. Um, and it depends on the data sets that you're using. Like Sherrader, for example, is pretty affordable. But some of these stuff for some of the things for equities, <clears throat> like um, Zax, for example, Zax and bar chart are pretty expensive, like multiple thousands of dollars a month. Um, so Zax Fundamentals Collection, but they have like, you know, a lot more information. So 19,500 U.S. and Canadian equities. 10,000 delisted stocks, um, you know, and a lot of them have like global data as well, like global equities. So it really just depends on what you want, but you can spend anywhere from a hundred bucks a month up to probably a hundred grand a year. Uh, uh, Wudo Smash, you clearly didn't get banned from asking questions because you're right here in the question box. <clears throat> I don't actually know much about AI at the moment. That's something that I'm experimenting with myself and algorithmic trading. It's something I'm just now starting to get into. Um, I've always used market data for doing research, um, but you know, you definitely can use stuff like Quandle. And then if you want like streaming data, there's um, IEX Cloud, which I don't really like IEX Cloud. I use it myself for lazy fa for a couple of things but i find it to be unreliable so uh, as an alternative to that there's a uh, polygon polygon.io <clears throat> this has real-time uh, pricing and volume data it's a little bit more expensive it's like 200 dollars a month um, but then there's also things like alpaca alpaca api i don't want pictures of actual alpacas um, <clears throat> so there's, there's all kinds of APIs for stock trading. Um, I've got a bunch of them in my GitHub. If you go to github.com slash, um, it's my GitHub and then slash market toolkit. Um, there's a, there's an API and developer resources section in here. Um, another good one is, uh, is Tingo which is actually run by a guy in this chat. Um, so they have an API also, which I'm gonna add to this list in the near future. Um, there's Exignite, Polygon, Quandle, um, and there's a bunch of different ones. What do you do in Python that you don't do in other FinTech like Bloomberg or FactSet? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So in Python, what I do with what I do with lazy FA, for example, um, is a lot of red flag detection. Uh, so So one of the things that I do is I pull in all of that 
data from the financial statements. And not only do I visualize it just to make it easier to read, you know, rather than going through 20 years of financial statements and 10K reports trying to find, you know, what the revenue trend looks like, it's a lot easier to just look like look at it on on a chart and see if there is any spikes or any kind of anomalies or anything like that. So that's one thing that I do with it just to make fundamental analysis faster. Um, and the other thing that I do with it is like red flag analysis. So um, I took a couple of different accounting courses and I went through all the financial statements looking for manipulation and like anything that seems odd. Like for example, on the balance sheet, it looks for outliers in debt load. So if there's any big spikes in debt in the data, then it'll alert this red flag. Um, it alerts you to things like if the average growth of their liabilities outweigh their average assets. Um, if there's outliers in capital expenditures, it looks for things like ballooning accounts receivable. So a lot of this stuff, you know, you can do it with Excel spreadsheets or whatever, um, but I do it automatically with Python. So that's a big part of what I'm using Python for is, um, you know, detecting red flags and looking for manipulation in the numbers. Um, there's also a couple of things like, um, for example, the Benish M score and Benford's law. Um, these are sort of pseudo fraud prediction algorithms uh, where if there's a big drop in the Benish M score or if there's a big spike in, in this indicator, um, you know, then it can indicate that there's some oddities in the financial statements. So it's a calculation of like a whole bunch of different things that take into account sales growth and depreciation and SG&A and that type of thing. Um, so you combine all these things together and there's like a super complex calculation to come up with this M score. Um, and you can do it all automatically using data from Quandle and Python. So that's what I do with it. Are you using any algos to trade or is this strictly for fundamental analysis? Yeah, so this is strictly for fundamental analysis. It's just for like research purposes. Um, I don't use any algos to actually trade. It's one of the things that I wanna get into. Um, but even for, um, even for trading, I wouldn't use fundamental data really for trading, maybe like news headlines and stuff like that. But uh, for algorithmic trading, I would focus more on technical analysis. So that would be more along the lines of um, stock fetcher, which we've talked about in past streams. Um, so I have a bunch of different filters that look for like different chart patterns. So what I plan to do actually when I start to get more into algorithmic trading is build something that looks for patterns similar to what I know works well from my stock fetcher experience. Um, so I'm going to be looking for similar patterns to this and then uh, back testing them and trying to, you know, build an algorithm that trades these patterns automatically. So we'll see how that works out. And I have never done it before, so I'm guessing it will probably be horrible at first, but hopefully with some experience, it'll get good. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, congratulations on quitting your job. Uh, yeah, so I quit my job in 2013. So I've been on my own for a long time. But um, Lazy FA right now is just kind of just now getting started because I've spent the last like two years building it instead of talking about it and actually using it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good feeling to just be able to work from home and do your own thing. So if you can ever get to that point, highly recommended. However, it does get kind of lonely occasionally. <clears throat> so you gotta keep yourself sane. Uh, can Quantle be used to build day trading scanners? Uh, possibly. I don't know if, I think something like Polygon would probably be better for that because for a day trading scanner, you're gonna want real time data. And Quandle is more of a data aggregator 
meaning they take data from financial statements and from economic reports and they aggregate it and standardize it so that you can use it for research purposes. Um, whereas something like Polygon or IEX Cloud, they use, they actually provide like real time exchange data and like prices and volume. So that's what you would probably want to use for algorithmic trading, you know, for making algos. So I would look into either Polygon um, or there's also uh, Alpaca has an API as well that allows you to actually execute trades. And I think actually I remember reading on um, on Reddit's Algo Trading subreddit that if you sign up for Alpaca and you fund it with real money, uh, if you fund their account with real money, then they give you a free uh, Polygon API key as well. Can it be used to set up triggers for auto trading? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what you would wanna do is probably just monitor one of these data sets for whenever it is, uh, for whenever it's updated. Um, and then whenever it's updated, you would do what you wanna do with it. Um, so again, I think it depends on your time frame, Mr. Ark, it depends on your time frame, right? Because if you're trying to do this like on an intraday on an intraday time frame then uh Quandle's probably not really what you're looking for because it doesn't provide that kind of data most of the data providers on Quandle don't provide that kind of data um but there i mean there might be a few that do but i don't know of any off the top of my head on Quandle. all right uh let me check the twitch stream real quick and make sure there's no questions that i'm missing there All right, so I really wish the quality on Twitch was better. Uh, Stick the dog, I don't know if you're still here, but uh, the operating system is Ubuntu. Um, Just scrolling through here looking for questions <laughs> one person said i honestly have no idea what's going on but i've always been interested in stocks and finance and coding where or what should i do to learn the basics of coding uh it depends on what you want to learn that's like a really really general question but in terms of finance and the stock market Quandle uh, and Quandle is really well known. Python is sort of the language of choice for most algorithmic traders. And then R is also really popular. So I would look into learning a little bit about R. I don't know anything at all about R, but I've always used Python and it works great for most of the stuff that I wanna do. Okay, let's see, anything else? think everybody in the Twitch stream took care of everyone else's questions, so that's good. <clears throat> um, run your Python scripts manually at home. Yeah, so what you could do is use something like Heroku. Um, when I first started working with Python, so like if I wanted to launch this stupid stock sound thing, um, just go to heroku.com and you can uh, stand, it's sort of like a, like a lightweight Amazon Web Services type of service. Um, so you create like an online Heroku app and then you can push your changes to it from your, uh, you know, from your local machine, you push to it because it's got its own uh, Git repo and all of that stuff. And it'll deploy to its own, like it stands up its own uh, server and everything. Um, and so you can run something like Heroku and uh, you can do that for free, but the downside to doing it for free on Heroku is that it'll shut down if it's not in use for like more than I think 30 minutes. And then it takes like a long time to stand back up. So if you want it to actually stay alive all the time, you have to pay for it, but it's cheap. I think it's like seven bucks a month per dyno 
Um, so per app that you want to run, as long as it's a simple application, Heroku works great for stuff like that. And it's super easy to use. So I would highly recommend that if you're just getting started. All right. <clears throat> so I think that's everything. Let's call it a night at this point. Um, like I said, I'll put this code. I've actually already got the code on GitHub because I pushed up the one that I built uh, last night. So if you go to github.com slash ckz8780, repositories and stock sound is the one that I built last night. So it's almost identical to this one, except it actually works. So you can clone this or whatever you want if you want to uh, you know, take it and mess around with it. Um, <clears throat> and then if you wanna just follow along with this video, then start with the Bootstrap 4 starter template. And all you need to do is create your environment and whatever on your local machine and then clone this repo into it. And that'll take you to um, step five. And then it takes like 10 minutes to just create that little config. And then everything that you need to do from that point, uh, you'll have to hit up YouTube for some Django tutorials. So that's that. Thank you so much for coming, guys. I know this was a long one. Um, I, I guess I was probably kind of naive thinking that I was going to get through all of that code in 30 minutes. <laughs> but uh, hopefully this was helpful to, uh, to people that are just getting started. And hopefully it was interesting to those who have been doing it for a long time. Um, if you do have any questions that I didn't get to, like I said, feel free to either tag me here in the chat or you can email me at chris at lazyfa.com. And that is it. So I guess uh, we'll call it a night here and I will talk to you the next time we do a live stream.